What's up, YouTube? It's Corey from The Overlook, and we go over the books you may have overlooked. We had a poll recently to pick the new series in the three top picks for Winter Soldier, Avengers Children Crusade, and DC's Identity Crisis. The latter won't start until Batman finishes up in two issues, but there is more news. We start Superior Carnage this week. Like I said before on other videos, two of our other series are wrapping up soon as well, so to make sure you don't get overlooked, write a comment down below on what series you want us to do next. Okay, enough talking, let's get started. It is storming outside in Chicago, Illinois. The heavy rain floods the city street and chases anyone who would be outside indoors in search of some warm comfort. For three officers planning a heist before an official raid, this seclusion could be seen as some good fortune. The three sit in a car, the two in front determined to make sure that the newest of the three members knows the plan and memorizes it down to the T. He is to roll up five minutes before the official raid at 8 a.m. Meanwhile, the two officers in the front of the car will be in and out. They'll leave the guns for the task force, but take half the drugs out through the alley. They go straight to Frank from there. The two veterans once again inform the newest officer, Arthur Hayes, that late getaway drivers lose limbs. If Arthur isn't there in time, it's his ass. Arthur nods his head as a sign of understanding and exits the vehicle. He drags his feet up the few steps leading to his apartment complex and enters the building. The emptiness of the hallways does nothing but exasperate the sound of the storm. He reaches his room, and before he walks in, a man emerges from the shadows. Arthur, on the defensive, tells the intruder that he is a cop and whoever they are. The intruder steps forward and reveals that he is none other than Bucky Barnes. It's okay, Arthur. I'm here to help. The, the Winter Soldier, Arthur states. A few moments pass and he nervously adds, I, I didn't think you'd come. I never heard back and tomorrow's supposed to, I know. Bucky interrupts while stepping through the open doorway and into the apartment. I can get you out, but you need to know, if we do this, there's no going back. Arthur tells Bucky that he has made mistakes, mistakes that he's not proud of. But the people he is entangled with now have a whole organization behind them. They can't be touched by other cops, and they will absolutely kill Arthur before they let him out. He just needs a way to start over fresh. Bucky gives the officer a small duffel bag before telling him, Whatever you can fit in the bag comes with. No electronics though. Your bank accounts will be cleaned and transferred. We'll get you all set up with new papers and IDs in a nice new town. You'll keep your first name only, but beyond that, you'll have no connection to this life. Bucky is interrupted by a loud banging at the door. A voice yells out for Arthur to open up. Come on, Arthur. Last minute change of plans. We got uh, stuff to go over. The two officers from earlier have decided to revisit Arthur in an attempt to close off some loose ends. The officer that was banging on the door now reaches for the doorknob. His hands glow scarlet with energy as he attempts to enter the living space by force. Bucky answers this by using his metal arm to punch through the doorway. The punch makes contact with the first officer and he flies backwards into the other and they both fall to the ground. Bucky breaks down the doorway and Arthur sprints out. He tells Arthur to keep moving before he is interrupted by the officer with the glowing hands. So you got some protection now, huh? Some tough guy muscle. 
The glow from the officer's hands becomes nearly tangible as the officer manipulates the energy to form into two cords that wrap the winter soldier before holding him up in midair. What's he paying you, buddy? Is it enough for new parts? Nope, Bucky responds. Guess I'm gonna have to borrow some of yours. Bucky reaches down and steals the officer's pistol and fires it off just inches away from the officer's ear. The officer falls to the ground and yells in pain as his eardrum bursts. Immediately following this event is the rumble of the earth beneath their feet as a squad of other officers make their way down the hall in preparation for the raid. Bucky asks Arthur if these police are good cops or bad cops. And of course, Arthur's answer is that they are bad. With no other options, Bucky grabs Arthur and jumps through a nearby window. On the way down, he grabs onto a nearby drainage pipe and it slows their descent just enough for them to land on their feet. From there, it is only a short walk to Bucky's motorcycle, and the two are on their way. As you know, we all build narratives. We tell ourselves stories about who we are and who, one day, we're going to be. Most of the time, things don't work out that way. Sometimes, they go really wrong. James Buchanan Barnes was made into a weapon, turned against his country and the people he cared about most. He lost decades. He committed atrocities. And then, a miracle happened. Somehow, against all odds, he was saved. Unfortunately, most people don't get that kind of second chance. What? You mean not everyone gets to be Captain America? Are you sure? We've had at least six of them, Tony Stark says as he works on Bucky's arm inside a small garage in Shelbyville, Indiana. Yeah, yeah, funny guy. You're the one who said you don't get why I'm doing this. Helping others find the redemption you were lucky enough to find makes sense to me. What I don't get is why you have to do it here. Tony swats a nearby mosquito that landed on his neck. I literally have bites on bites. A woman walks into the garage and hands Tony a drink. What's the matter, Tony? City boy feeling out of his element? Tony looks up and gives a head nod, signaling his thanks to the woman, Agent Carter, and says, All I feel is humidity. Wait, I thought you were working for Ross now, Carter. Sharon's a time management wizard, Bucky scoffs. More like embracing the power nap, Sharon says jokingly. But seriously, you know Tony. All three of us have been able to start over, at one point or another. The circumstances may have been different, but there's one thing that's the same. None of us did it on our own. Bucky smirks and tells Tony that they are still working out all the kinks, but the relocation program is a work in progress. What really matters is a place to lie low while they do which is why they chose the Midwest. Lying low and starting new is easier said than done when every moment you close your eyes, you don't see some kind of twisted horror from your past. Every time, it's something different, something repressed, something as small as him being stuck in his cryostasis. He would wake up and once again smell the air of the darkened room filled with machinery. But this time, there's something different. A man, in a doctor's coat just like the others, and speaking perfect Russian, reaches out a hand to the Winter Soldier and tells him that he is going to get Bucky out of there. Back home, to America, and in his delusion, Bucky tells the man, no, no, and he reaches out his metal arm and grabs the doctor by the neck. 
The look in the man's eyes as his life slips away is burned into Bucky's memory, and it will never go away. Bucky wakes up from his meditation by a knocking at his door. Stark had to bail, but he said to let him know if there's anything else he can do to help, like sending funds if we need. Oh, sorry. It's okay. I just finished, Bucky says while standing up from his yoga mat. So, the meditation stuff is working? It's intense. There's a memory... I've been on the edges of, although, to be honest, I'm not really sure how much is still missing. Well, none of us can remember everything. Bucky walks over to his desk, picks up a pencil, and starts scribbling down in his dream journal. Not with that attitude. Sorry, want to make sure I get this down while it's still fresh. Bucky gets a call from a relocatee out in Wisconsin. Apparently, there's been some trouble. The man in question, Terry, is an ex-Hydra member, and even though it's only been a week, the guy hasn't checked in. Bucky knows that starting over in a new place takes some getting used to, but something tells him that he better go check on Terry in person, just to make sure. Fingers crossed, it's nothing serious. Later that night, Bucky finds Terry in a small bar within the town. I hate it, Terry tells Bucky, already past the point of inebriation. I hate everything about it. This town. God, it's so quiet all the time. How does anyone live like this? Come on, Terry. Starting over is a process. You knew this was going to take some time. The bartender walks over and asks the two men if they would like to order anything. They have breakfast all day, she adds. Just some waters for now, thanks, Bucky tells her. Once the bartender is out of earshot, Terry bursts into tears. I can never remember my new last name. I still don't know anybody. My job, if you can call it that, is a joke. Who wants to bag groceries? You were helping Hydra torture people, Terry. I know, I know, I know. You told me you couldn't live with yourself anymore. That you would do anything to be done with them and have a real chance at a life of your own. Remember? Terry defensively said, But I miss people, you know? Me and Amy, we were doing pretty good. And now, now I'll never know. And now, now I'm so alone. Look, you're going through a major life change here. It's going to be a process. But maybe, maybe we should get you someone to talk to. I can find a good therapist. Yeah, that's what Amy says too, Terry says, while wiping away his tears. Bucky looks up for the first time and asks, Wait, you've talked to Amy? At that moment, a flurry of bullets fire off into the open bar. Three of the bullets pierce through Terry's chest and he wails in pain before collapsing over his stool. Bucky is quick enough to react throwing his metal arm up to block him and the bartender from the incoming barrage. Everyone down, stay down, he instructs, trying his hardest to be louder than the bellowing gunfire. Bucky ducks behind his arm and sprints towards the exit where the gunman is standing. A number of shots lands directly in the center of Bucky's chest and the force of the impact knocks him on the ground. The bullets sizzle as they sit buried in Bucky's bulletproof vest. The gunfire subsides, but Bucky's ears still ring from the disorienting noise. And then he sees it. Shock spreads across his face as the gunman approaches and asks, Can't breathe? They always tell me the vest helps, but I've never thought so. Still feels like getting hit by a truck. Anyway, wow, Mr. Barnes, here in the flesh. 
I'm honestly pretty excited to kill you. I'm a big fan. What's up, YouTube? It's Corey from The Overlook, and we go over the books you may have overlooked. We had a poll recently to pick the new series and the three top picks for Winter Soldier, Avengers Children Crusade, and DC's Identity Crisis. The latter won't start until Batman finishes up in two issues, but there is more news. We start Superior Carnage this week. Like I said before on other videos, two of our other series are wrapping up soon as well, so to make sure you don't get overlooked, write a comment down below on what series you want us to do next. Okay, enough talking, let's get started. It is storming outside in Chicago, Illinois. The heavy rain floods the city street and chases anyone who would be outside indoors in search of some warm comfort. For three officers planning a heist before an official raid, this seclusion could be seen as some good fortune. The three sit in a car, the two in front determined to make sure that the newest of the three members knows the plan and memorizes it down to the T. He is to roll up five minutes before the official raid at 8 a.m. Meanwhile, the two officers in the front of the car will be in and out. They'll leave the guns for the task force, but take half the drugs out through the alley. They go straight to Frank from there. The two veterans once again inform the newest officer, Arthur Hayes, that late getaway drivers lose limbs. If Arthur isn't there in time, it's his ass. Arthur nods his head as a sign of understanding and exits the vehicle. He drags his feet up the few steps leading to his apartment complex and enters the building. The emptiness of the hallways does nothing but exasperate the sound of the storm. He reaches his room, and before he walks in, a man emerges from the shadows. Arthur, on the defensive, tells the intruder that he is a cop and whoever they are. The intruder steps forward and reveals that he is none other than Bucky Barnes. It's okay, Arthur. I'm here to help. The, the Winter Soldier, Arthur states. A few moments pass and he nervously adds, I, I didn't think you'd come. I never heard back and tomorrow was supposed to. I know. Bucky interrupts while stepping through the open doorway and into the apartment. I can get you out, but you need to know, if we do this, there's no going back. Arthur tells Bucky that he has made mistakes, mistakes that he's not proud of. But the people he is entangled with now have a whole organization behind them. They can't be touched by other cops, and they will absolutely kill Arthur before they let him out. He just needs a way to start over, fresh. Bucky gives the officer a small duffel bag before telling him, Whatever you can fit in the bag comes with. No electronics, though. Your bank accounts will be cleaned and transferred. We'll get you all set up with new papers and IDs in a nice new town. You'll keep your first name only, but beyond that, you'll have no connection to this life. Bucky is interrupted by a loud banging at the door. A voice yells out for Arthur to open up. Come on, Arthur. Last minute change of plans. We got uh, stuff to go over. The two officers from earlier have decided to revisit Arthur in an attempt to close off some loose ends. The officer that was banging on the door now reaches for the doorknob. His hands glow scarlet with energy as he attempts to enter the living space by force. Bucky answers this by using his metal arm to punch through the doorway. The punch makes contact with the first officer and he flies backwards into the other and they both fall to the ground. Bucky breaks down the doorway and Arthur sprints out. 
He tells Arthur to keep moving before he is interrupted by the officer with the glowing hands. So you got some protection now, huh? Some tough guy muscle. The glow from the officer's hands becomes nearly tangible as the officer manipulates the energy to form into two cords that wrap the winter soldier before holding him up in midair. What's he paying you, buddy? Is it enough for new parts? Nope, Bucky responds. Guess I'm gonna have to borrow some of yours. Bucky reaches down and steals the officer's pistol and fires it off just inches away from the officer's ear. The officer falls to the ground and yells in pain as his eardrum bursts. Immediately following this event is the rumble of the earth beneath their feet as a squad of other officers make their way down the hall in preparation for the raid. Bucky asks Arthur if these police are good cops or bad cops. And of course, Arthur's answer is that they are bad. With no other options, Bucky grabs Arthur and jumps through a nearby window. On the way down, he grabs onto a nearby drainage pipe and it slows their descent just enough for them to land on their feet. From there, it is only a short walk to Bucky's motorcycle, and the two are on their way. As you know, we all build narratives. We tell ourselves stories about who we are and who, one day, we're going to be. Most of the time, things don't work out that way. Sometimes, they go really wrong. James Buchanan Barnes was made into a weapon, turned against his country and the people he cared about most. He lost decades. He committed atrocities. And then, a miracle happened. Somehow, against all odds, he was saved. Unfortunately, most people don't get that kind of second chance. What? You mean not everyone gets to be Captain America? Are you sure? We've had at least six of them. Tony Stark says as he works on Bucky's arm inside a small garage in Shelbyville, Indiana. Yeah, yeah, funny guy. You're the one who said you don't get why I'm doing this. Helping others find the redemption you were lucky enough to find makes sense to me. What I don't get is why you have to do it here. Tony swats a nearby mosquito that landed on his neck. I literally have bites on bites. A woman walks into the garage and hands Tony a drink. What's the matter, Tony? City boy feeling out of his element? Tony looks up and gives a head nod, signaling his thanks to the woman, Agent Carter, and says, All I feel is humidity. Wait, I thought you were working for Ross now, Carter. Sharon's a time management wizard, Bucky scoffs. More like embracing the power nap, Sharon says jokingly. But seriously, you know Tony. All three of us have been able to start over, at one point or another. The circumstances may have been different, but there's one thing that's the same. None of us did it on our own. Bucky smirks and tells Tony that they are still working out all the kinks, but the relocation program is a work in progress. What really matters is a place to lie low while they do which is why they chose the Midwest. Lying low and starting new is easier said than done when every moment you close your eyes, you don't see some kind of twisted horror from your past. Every time, it's something different, something repressed, something as small as him being stuck in his cryostasis. He would wake up and once again smell the air of the darkened room filled with machinery. But this time, there is something different. A man, in a doctor's coat just like the others, and speaking perfect Russian, reaches out a hand to the Winter Soldier and tells him that he is going to get Bucky out of there. Back home, to America, 
And in his delusion, Bucky tells the man, no, no. And he reaches out his metal arm and grabs the doctor by the neck. The look in the man's eyes as his life slips away is burned into Bucky's memory. And it will never go away. Bucky wakes up from his meditation by a knocking at his door. Stark had to bail, but he said to let him know if there's anything else he can do to help, like sending funds if we need. Oh, sorry. It's okay. I just finished, Bucky says while standing up from his yoga mat. So, the meditation stuff is working? It's intense. There's a memory... I've been on the edges of, although, to be honest, I'm not really sure how much is still missing. Well, none of us can remember everything. Bucky walks over to his desk, picks up a pencil, and starts scribbling down in his dream journal. Not with that attitude. Sorry, want to make sure I get this down while it's still fresh. Bucky gets a call from a relocatee out in Wisconsin. Apparently, there's been some trouble. The man in question, Terry, is an ex-Hydra member, and even though it's only been a week, the guy hasn't checked in. Bucky knows that starting over in a new place takes some getting used to, but something tells him that he better go check on Terry in person, just to make sure. Fingers crossed, it's nothing serious. Later that night, Bucky finds Terry in a small bar within the town. I hate it, Terry tells Bucky, already past the point of inebriation. I hate everything about it. This town. God, it's so quiet all the time. How does anyone live like this? Come on, Terry. Starting over is a process. You knew this was going to take some time. The bartender walks over and asks the two men if they would like to order anything. They have breakfast all day, she adds. Just some waters for now, thanks, Bucky tells her. Once the bartender is out of earshot, Terry bursts into tears. I can never remember my new last name. I still don't know anybody. My job, if you can call it that, is a joke. Who wants to bag groceries? You were helping Hydra torture people, Terry. I know, I know, I know. You told me you couldn't live with yourself anymore. That you would do anything to be done with them and have a real chance at a life of your own. Remember? Terry defensively said, But I miss people, you know? Me and Amy, we were doing pretty good. And now, now I'll never know. And now, now I'm so alone. Look, you're going through a major life change here. It's going to be a process. But maybe, maybe we should get you someone to talk to. I can find a good therapist. Yeah, that's what Amy says too, Terry says, while wiping away his tears. Bucky looks up for the first time and asks, Wait, you've talked to Amy? At that moment, a flurry of bullets fire off into the open bar. Three of the bullets pierce through Terry's chest and he wails in pain before collapsing over his stool. Bucky is quick enough to react throwing his metal arm up to block him and the bartender from the incoming barrage. Everyone down, stay down, he instructs, trying his hardest to be louder than the bellowing gunfire. Bucky ducks behind his arm and sprints towards the exit where the gunman is standing. A number of shots lands directly in the center of Bucky's chest and the force of the impact knocks him on the ground. The bullets sizzle as they sit buried in Bucky's bulletproof vest. The gunfire subsides, but Bucky's ears still ring from the disorienting noise. And then he sees it. Shock spreads across his face as the gunman approaches and asks, Can't breathe? They always tell me the vest helps, 
but I've never thought so. Still feels like getting hit by a truck. Anyway, wow, Mr. Barnes, here in the flesh. I'm honestly pretty excited to kill you. I'm a big fan. In Bucky's garage, somewhere in the Midwest, Tony Stark is once again making a house call to fix damages done to Bucky's cybernetic arm. Tony tries to give him some advice. Bucky should really invest in a backup arm. Not that he doesn't absolutely love dropping everything and racing to the middle of Indiana twice in two days. So, next time, I should call Ironheart. Got it. Meanwhile, Sharon Carter is finishing up giving RJ first aid. She tells Bucky that what RJ needs most right now is a lot of rest. He'll have it. Bucky confirms. Tony, being the one to ask the obvious, wonders what Bucky actually knows about this kid. I know enough, Bucky says shortly. After some time, he goes to check on RJ up in his room upstairs. At the moment, RJ is still a little groggy from the day before. Bucky tells him that his bullet wound will be closing soon thanks to some targeted nanite repair, but he will need to stay at the house for at least a few days until he gets his strength back. And you're welcome to stay as long as you want. There are things I might be able to help you with. I know what it's like to be turned into something you're not, to have your life stolen from you. But I also know what it's like to take it back. Time goes by and days drag on until it's two weeks later. RJ is in another one of his imposed therapy sessions with Dr. Leonard Sampson. Would you mind sitting up, please? The doctor asks the slouch teenager. Do I have to? We've talked about this, RJ. Thank you. What do I have to talk about today? Whatever you'd like. I'm sick of talking. What else are you sick of? When RJ doesn't respond, the doctor follows up with another question. Do you want to leave? What? Well, no one's forcing you to stay. If you have somewhere else you'd like to go, I bet Mr. Barnes would even take you there. Is that what you want? He says to call him Bucky. He certainly does, doesn't he? Are you two getting along? RJ rolls his eyes. He's just being nice so I don't kill him. Do you really think that's all this is? Do you want to kill him? I'm supposed to. There are a lot of things that people tell us we're supposed to do, but that doesn't mean we have to. You've been through quite a lot. It's okay to be sick of talking, but I hope you know we do want to help you, RJ. Mr. Colt gave me somewhere to stay and introduced me to people who could help me. He also showed me files on all sorts of different people, including you, Dr. Sampson. I know you are the Hulk's doctor. In a matter of speaking, yes. You spent a lot of time trying to help him, but you couldn't. So why should I listen to anything you have to say? Later that evening, Dr. Sampson gives Bucky an update on his progress with RJ. It seems that after constantly being pulled out of toxic situations, RJ's instincts are kicking in and he is questioning everyone's motivations. At the moment, everything RJ knows has just fallen away. The closest thing he had to a father figure turned on him, 
tried to kill him. And suddenly, the person he was modeled after and sent off to murder has taken him in. As far as RJ's real family, his mother died when he was five. His father is still a mystery. The best thing that Bucky can do for the boy is give him time and positive reinforcement. Thanks, Doc. I really appreciate you making time for this. That's what I'm here for. Speaking of, how are you doing? It's been a little while since we really talked. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm good. This whole new initiative with sharing has me pretty buried, but I'm doing what you said, finding time to clear my head, letting whatever comes back, come back. Are you keeping up with the journal? Oof, yeah, I am. Gotta say, I've got a whole new respect for writers. I can't believe how hard it is to stay honest, even knowing I'm the only one who will ever read it. Later, Bucky brings RJ with him into town to run a couple of errands. When they are through, Bucky asks RJ where he wants to eat. RJ snaps back. I told you, I'm not hungry, so you can stop asking. Bucky tries to reason with RJ, saying that he understands that this is a lot to get used to. But on the brighter side, that means that anything is possible. Whatever RJ wants his life to be, it can be. Whatever he wants to change, hell, he could even change his name. He could be Robert, Ryan, or maybe even Rick. They could drop the K and make it look hip. RJ raises an eyebrow and asks, How has no one tried to kill you yet? Bucky tells RJ that it certainly isn't for lack of trying before submitting that everyone deserves a second chance. Bucky then gets a call from one of his clients, an ex-SHIELD agent, well, double agent, turned on an Eastern European gang and then needed a clean way out of the life. Right now, he thinks he's been made, spotted in town. Bucky decides that the best course of action will be to at least stop by and check on the guy. He also offers RJ to tag along. It might be good for you to see what all this looks like, right? For someone other than me. Plus, I trust you. And the more I can show you that, hopefully, the more you'll start to trust me. RJ and Bucky ride through the dead of night to reach a small cabin in the forests of Michigan. The man in hiding, Seth, continues to chug down his fifth beer. He tells Bucky, But when I doubled back, the car was still there. And however unlikely it might be, I've really got a bad feeling about it. I've worked in counter surveillance. I know what a tale is. Bucky tells Seth that it's probably nothing, but him and his new partner will hang around for a couple of hours to watch the perimeter for anyone that circles back. Bucky sees RJ staring, captivated by something just outside the window. What is it? He asks. There's something strange just before the tree line. Bucky looks out the window and sees dozens of floating black circles peppered throughout the forest. Quickly, he turns to the others and asks, Seth, how fast can you get to your car? What? I mean, at that moment, two black holes pop up behind Seth and a white arm jets out of each of the two holes and reaches for him. Get down, Bucky yells. Seth ducks just in time to avoid being taken and Bucky runs over and grabs one of the arms before pulling the attacker out of the black hole and into the room. Barnes, right? Weird. We've never crossed paths before, says the man as he lands on the ground. 
Dr. Jonathan Own, the supervillain known as The Spot. Bucky and RJ pull out their pistols and begin to aim it at The Spot, but The Spot throws one of his black holes after another until the entire cabin is covered with miniature portals. One of the holes flies right towards RJ and Bucky pushes him out just in time for RJ to avoid any damage. However, the portal is able to make contact with Bucky's mechanical arm and shreds it off of Bucky's body. With only one arm left, Bucky rushes forward, firing his pistol and orders RJ, get Seth to his car and out of here. Out of here? The spot mocks. Really? You do know what my power is, right? This place is surrounded. Good luck getting anywhere. The spot produces a black hole in front of him and begins to punch into it. His punches hit Bucky and RJ dozens of times within seconds until Bucky charges the spot and tackles him into one of the portals in order to give the other two some time. Bucky falls down into the vast world of nothingness. Black portals begin to spot around the area, and the spot's voice echoes through each of them. Coming here? To my world. You've got heart, buddy. Brains, on the other hand. Well, seems like they went the way of your arm. RJ escorts Seth to his truck and tells Seth to keep driving and not to stop until he is at least across state lines before running away. Wait, where are you going? Seth asks as he starts up the truck. RJ sprints over to Bucky's motorcycle and reaches into the compartment on the back before removing the new Stark Tech Amplified cybernetic arm. Inside the other world, Bucky attempts to defend himself with only one arm. The spot makes easy work of Bucky landing one punch after another and tells him, props where props are due. You did a pretty good job hiding this guy. If it weren't for some damn random luck, my employers would have never found him. But they did, and so did I. And here we are. Don't worry, I'll make sure they know you went down with a fight. The spot prepares to land the killing blow, but is stopped short when RJ dives into one of the portals and begins to unload both the clips in his pistols. Bullets fly through one portal after the next and do not slow in their momentum. RJ ducks and rushes over to Bucky's side, carrying the new arm. RJ? Bucky asks in shock. What are you doing here? Saving you. Here. RJ tosses Bucky his new arm. Put this to good use. Bucky equips the new arm and it snaps into place. The sound of energy crackling through the metal shrieks through the room as Bucky's hand begins to glow blue with a small electric charge. The spot removes all of the surrounding portals in order to cease the bullets riddling the area, boasting, Go ahead, waste all your ammo. It won't do you any good in here. I can move things around as I see fit. You don't stand a chance, do you hear me? Bucky rushes the spot and hits him with a fully charged haymaker. The spot's body goes limp and he falls to the floor, unconscious. All the remaining portals begin to disappear. Later, once the two return to the cabin with the spot in custody, Bucky makes the call to Sharon to debrief her on their current status. Sharon tells Bucky that they will start right away on getting Seth another place to live, but all in all, she is surprised Bucky brought RJ along on this mission. She is aware of RJ's situation, and she suggests that Bucky might need to focus on better outlets for RJ's skills. After the phone call ends, Bucky takes the time to thank RJ as much as he hates the idea of using Tony's souped up arm, RJ really saved him with it. Seth and I owe you. RJ looks away and tells Bucky he's a liar. You want me to trust you? 
but you're lying to me. You're lying to Seth. You said we could get better like you, that we could start over and our lives would become perfect like yours. I never said that, Bucky says sternly, looking at RJ with his one good eye. But that's what this is all about, right? Some perfect, noble life you're trying to create? Like something from a movie where you get to be the savior? That's not fair. All I'm trying to do is show people they can live a happier life. But that's the lie, because they can't. You can't. I read your journal. I know about the dreams you have. I know you're still angry. I know you haven't gotten over what happened to you, the things you did. You're telling people they can move on, that they can start over, telling us we can change, be whatever we want to be, but you can't even do it yourself. You want me to trust you? Then tell me the truth. Why are you really doing this? What do you get out of it? RJ throws his hands in the air, waiting for an answer. Bucky takes a moment before telling him, People tell me I've redeemed myself. In some days, I think that's true. Other days, I don't. Helping people helps me to feel worthwhile again. And maybe, hopefully, it'll make those days where I do feel like I've turned a corner. Not be so rare. I'm sorry if you thought I was promising you a perfect life, RJ. That wasn't my intention. All I can promise, all that is true for me, is that every day can be slightly easier than the last, and that I'll help you any way I can, that you won't end up as far down the path as I was. You won't be alone. Tears begin to form in RJ's eyes. He quickly goes to hide them and mutters out, I don't, I don't want to be a killer. I know, and the good news is, you don't have to be. Bucky and RJ take off and don't arrive back at Bucky's house until the early morning. Bucky parks his bike, and the two walk to the front door discussing what they should order to eat when Bucky hears a rustling coming from the backyard. You've got three seconds to come out, or I come and drag you out, Bucky yells out into the distance. An unassuming, middle-aged man pokes his head out from around the corner and walks out with his hands up. Sorry, sorry, I wasn't trying to sneak up on you. Who are you? Bucky asks, but the man doesn't respond. Instead, he says, I can't believe it's really you, RJ. How do you know his name? Bucky asks. RJ looks back at Bucky and shrugs before the two turn back to the man. The man drops his hands and looks at Bucky for the first time before saying, I'm his dad. File number 29183, Richie Edward Boyle, born and raised on the streets of Philadelphia, half Irish, half Italian. He was a hustler, a con man, always looking for an angle, and an easy set of wheels. At 30, he'd wed his longtime girlfriend, Anne O'Brien. At age 35, he had a son. But, with the family at home, a sick wife, and no straight job on the horizon, times got tough, and Richie got desperate. Six bank heists in two years. When the cops finally caught up with him, he was sentenced 
to 15 years for armed robbery with the possibility of parole at 10. Two weeks ago, 14 years to the day of going inside, he got an early release and found his way here. What a coincidence. Bucky scoffs. On the other side of the call, Sharon Carter admits that she would be lying if she said it didn't make her raise both eyebrows. But she's been through all the data points, police reports, even his prison records, Richie's story checks out. And as much as she knows Bucky doesn't want to hear it, the blood and DNA are a match. He is RJ's father. Bucky uses his binoculars from across the street of a restaurant to keep an eye on RJ's dinner with his father. Inside the restaurant, the waitress places down their two mills and Richie comments to RJ. Just the protein scramble, huh? You sure you don't want to spice it up with something else? Sausage patties, maybe some bacon. I don't like bacon, RJ snaps. Richie throws his hands up in defense, saying, whoa, 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 okay, no bacon? Got it. My boy's a creature of habit. I respect that. I just, you know, I'm happy you're willing to talk to me like this. These last couple of days, it's really been great. RJ isn't too sure how he feels about the situation at the moment, but as far as his father is concerned, it's a sign. When he was sitting in that bar just a day out of the joint and he looked up to the TV and to see what he saw, it's unbelievable. What are the odds that at that moment they'd be playing that news footage of Bucky Barnes and right next to him, Richie's boy. RJ cuts his father off, wondering how Richie could even recognize him. He went to prison when RJ was one. Richie pulls out a photo from his jacket and hands it to RJ. On it, a small boy with black hair being hugged by a brown-haired woman. Your mom, she sent this to me just before she, well, I mean before she passed. I've been looking at it every day for the last 10 years. RJ lowers the photo and tells his father that he isn't the same boy as he was back then. But that doesn't matter to Richie. To him, this right here is a second chance for RJ, for him, for their family. And he knows that it's going to take time for the two of them to get to know each other better. But Richie would really like a chance to be a dad. RJ and Richie finish their meals and exit the restaurant. They prepare to say their goodbyes when three men walk down the sidewalk and approach them. The men immediately recognize Richie and begin to laugh amongst themselves at the coincidence. Oh, uh, hey, Henry, you guys are, uh, a little far from Philly. We go where the work takes us, Richie Rich. Oh, we probably shouldn't call him Richie Rich, should we? If he were Richie Rich, he would have paid us back already. Richie begins to step backwards to distance himself, but RJ's instincts kick in and he raises his fists in defense. He tells the three men, you should leave now. The man in the center, also the only man in a suit, presumably Henry, leans forward and scowls at RJ. Well, well, who do we have here, Richie Rich? This your kid? Listen, little buddy, your dad, he's not great with communication. In particular, the listening part. So, we're gonna have to explain some things to him. Slow. 
I'd recommend you go around that corner over there so you don't have to see. RJ doesn't let him finish his sentence. He quickly slices a precise chop against the suited man's throat before turning and immediately landing a left haymaker on the man to his right. The last of the three men tries to grab RJ from behind to calm him down, but RJ bites down on the man's hand and throws an elbow backwards. Blood flies into the air as the last man falls to the ground. The men now grow angry and are about to point their aggression towards RJ. Before they can coordinate an attack, the Winter Soldier arrives. Bucky tells the men to run away and they comply for now, stating that Richie has two days, and next time, they won't say hi first. When the men are out of sight, Bucky looks towards RJ and asks, Are you okay? I'm fine. What are you doing here? Making sure you're fine. Richie interrupts, yelling out, So, you've been following us. Oh, that's great. I'm here trying to reconnect with my son and you're spying on us. Real classy, Buck. Bucky navigates the topic of discussion back to the people in question. Who are they? Richie explains that those men were just a few friends of his that he met in prison. They looked out for him when he first got out and set him up with some starter funds. Starter funds of about... 50 grand at five points a week that's $2,500 a week in interest when Bucky asks Richie how he planned to ever pay them back Richie snaps hey screw you Barnes you know what on second thought I don't have to stand here and explain myself to you I'm done Richie turns to leave but stops to speak to RJ. I'm gonna head back to the motel and make a few calls. Get this sorted out. But I'll see you tomorrow, okay? And don't worry about this. I'll be fine. Once Richie leaves, RJ asks Bucky to help his dad out. You're setting people up with new lives, right? So why can't you do that for him? You keep saying that people deserve second chances. Well, he messed up and he paid for it. Now, he's trying to start over and do better. He's trying to make himself better. Bucky tries to explain that RJ's father got out of jail and immediately went into debt to a loan shark. That's not exactly great decision making. Yeah, well... It's harder to get back on your feet when you're not best friends with Captain America. A couple of days later, Bucky tracks down Henry and the other men to a small deli in Philadelphia. Bucky throws a few stacks of money on the table and tells them Richie's turned his life around. And, as such, they are going to forgive his debt or else they get to deal with him. The men accept the money, but warn Bucky that Richie Boyle is a deadbeat. People can change, Bucky says shortly. The three men begin to roar in laughter. Bucky raises a pistol, explaining, Sorry, I think there was some confusion. I'm not here for your opinion. The men put their hands up and tell the Avenger that the point is taken. For all intents and purposes, they will consider the situation resolved. A few days after that, Bucky successfully moves Richie into his own apartment, only about 10 minutes from Shelbyville. The fridge is already stocked, there are fresh sheets on the bed, and a clean cell phone on the counter. Bucky even got Richie a new job, barbacking at a place called Gundy's. Gundy's? Really? That's your idea of helping somebody start over? Dad. Look, I really do appreciate this, Buck. 
What's most important of all is that I get to spend time with my boy. I wouldn't trade that for the world. Richie places his hand on RJ's shoulder and says, I won't let you down, either of you. The next day, Richie spends his time with RJ complaining about his new job. And these guys, they can't even lift a keg themselves, but they want an 80-20 split on tips. What a racket. Well, it's not forever, RJ tells his father optimistically. Oh, you better believe it's not, kiddo. Your dad's got big things in his future. Just gotta get the right break. At that moment, Richie gets a call on his cell phone. The conversation is short, but it leaves with Richie telling his son, Speak of the devil, an old friend with a great opportunity. You gave someone your number? Bucky said, Oh, it's fine. Buck's just paranoid. I've known this guy forever. I can trust him. And besides, what is it? RJ asks in a more pessimistic tone. Richie lights up and says, Well, since you asked, it's a card game. A big one, a super vulnerable, just waiting to be hit. Honestly, it's not a matter of if, but when. Anyway, it's actually a two-man job. We could do it together, and the amount of money from this thing, whew, we'd really have enough to start over and live the good life. But you are starting over. No, I, I know, I know, but come on. The only way to really be what you want to be in this world is with money. And this, this is a great opportunity. I don't think it's a good idea, RJ tells his father, his eyes lowering to the table. Oh, oh, you know what? You're right. Absolutely. It was just a crazy idea. Elsewhere, Bucky sits in his backyard, alone, until Sharon joins him. She tells him that he has been quiet the last few days, and Bucky lets her know that they got RJ out, through the worst of it, and just when RJ started to open back up, when he started to trust again, this two-bit con man shows up. I'm losing him. I can feel it. Is he really yours to lose? Ultimately, He's got to make choices for himself, right? Isn't that what this is all about? Bucky almost starts to believe Sharon. That is, until her phone pings as she receives a video. It's from the prison two weeks before Richie was released. Sharon hands her phone over to Bucky, and he examines the screen. It's everything he feared. At Gundy's, after hours, Richie is joined by two of his old friends. Richie explains to the two that he went by the hit location earlier that night to scope it all out. His friends were right. There are blind spots everywhere. Even with security, it's definitely doable. Ah, that's great news, Richie. This is gonna be killer, one of the men says. See? I told you he'd be up for it. Richie pours the three of them a drink, and his friends ask him about the supposed partner Richie has been telling them about. Ah, uh, right, I've got the partner. Young guy, but with a ton of potential. Really, I've seen him in action. He's perfect for this. And he's on board. Oh, yeah. We got to work out some of the details, but he'll, he'll be there. The two men leave, and Richie closes up shop. He smugly struts down the sidewalk and turns down an alleyway to head towards his apartment. Suddenly, he hears a voice from the shadows saying, 
This is not a request. It's not even a conversation. Pack your bags and leave. You're done. Richie doubles backwards to see Bucky standing there waiting for him. Whoa, 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 Sheriff Barnes. Is that it? I'm RJ's family, and nothing you can do can change that. You got no claim to my boy. Bucky pulls out a tablet and hands it to Richie. Neither does Hydra. Two weeks ago, just before you were released, you were paid a visit by a man who I just learned had broken out of custody. Richie watches as the tablet plays a video of him speaking to Mr. Colt, the man in the white suit, while he was in prison. Bucky tells him, Colt wants you to pull RJ back into Hydra, doesn't he? That's why he came to you. No, 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 that's, I mean, this guy came to see me right before I got out. He said RJ had gone off the grid and he was worried about him. He was just looking for a lead, but I didn't know anything and even if I could have helped him, I wouldn't. You really expect me to believe they didn't send you here so they could keep their hooks in RJ. You believe whatever the hell you want. I don't give a damn about them. I only care about my boy. Is that why you're volunteering him to help you over a card game? Richie steps forward with his fists clenched. You better watch how you talk to me, Buck. I'm his father. No, you're a deadbeat con man who's either lying about Hydra or too stupid to know they're using you. Either way, you're done. Pack your bags and get out of his life or deal with me. He's my son, not yours. He's my son, Richie yells, his rage now at the tipping point. He throws a pair of hooks that are easily dodged by Bucky. Then, Bucky lands a counter shot that causes Richie to spit out blood. Richie then rushes Bucky. He attempts to throw a haymaker, but slips and falls face first into the corner of a dumpster. Bucky then watches helplessly as the collision snaps Richie's neck. As Richie falls to the ground and as blood slowly begins to pour out of his open wound. Within a small diner in Shelbyville, Indiana, RJ awaits the arrival of his father, Richie. Recently, since his father returned into his life, the two of them have been sharing a meal every night around the same time. But as the seconds turn to minutes and the minutes into over an hour, RJ begins to worry. He sends his fifth text to his father to make sure everything is okay. And still, there is no response. Unbeknownst to RJ, his father has already been dead for some time. After Richie died, it did not take long for Bucky to clean the crime scene. Finding a way to dispose of the body could also be just as easy, but the guilt weighs on him. As he looks for answers and direction, Bucky turns to Sharon Carter, telling her the right move is for Richie to just disappear. RJ never has to know. Bucky convinces Sharon to help him bury the body in a nearby forest, all the while attempting to mask his own culpability. What? I should have left him for the police to find? Saddle RJ with this unsolved murder of his father. Define his life as some sort of revenge-fueled quest that he'll never be able to finish. So, what? 
you're just going to dig a hole? That's the plan. Bucky digs the shovel into the ground and scoops out a pile of dirt. Then, why did you call me? I don't know. Sharon grabs the shovel and forces Bucky to focus on their conversation. I think you do know. And it's the same reason you haven't done it yet. Sharon goes to pull the shovel away from Bucky and he doesn't even put up a fight. Instead, he points to the truck of the car, telling Sharon, the man was a leech, Sharon. Give him enough time. He would have absolutely pulled RJ down with him, if not back to Colt and back into Hydra. RJ's better out without Richie in his life. I don't disagree, but that's not your choice to make. Bucky explains to Sharon that he's been having nightmares. Back when he was a Soviet spy, one night, a scientist thought him out of his cryostasis and tried to help him escape. And so, Bucky killed him. Sometimes, he explains, people don't know what's best for themselves. Look, Sharon concedes, I'm not going to tell you what to do here, but if you really want to help this kid, if you want him to trust you, this isn't the way. I have a place we can keep the body on ice until you tell RJ the truth. I'm proposing you do the right thing here for RJ and for you. Elsewhere, RJ leaves the restaurant in search of his father. The first place RJ checks is Richie's apartment. RJ picks the lock, rather easily, he must admit, and swings the door open. The creak of the door echoes through the cramped one-bedroom apartment. RJ creeps forward on high alert, but still misses Mr. Colt hiding within the shadows. The Hydra agent leans against the bedroom doorway, waving around Richie's Polaroid picture of RJ and his mother. All your dad's things, exactly where he left them. Interesting, isn't it? RJ holds up his fists, preparing to defend against a sneak attack, and Mr. Colt tells him, Relax, boy. I'm only here because I'm worried about you. I'm not gonna hurt you unless you make me. The police had you, Mr. Colt. Bucky said, I'm sure Bucky Barnes says a lot of things. Maybe you should be more selective about who you listen to. Mr. Colt says behind a cheeky sneer. Besides, there's still too much for you and me to do together. RJ rushes Mr. Colt, bellowing out, You tortured me! Manipulated me! You stole my life! You tried to kill me! RJ hits Mr. Colt with a lamp before landing a right hook. He tries to follow up with another punch, but Mr. Colt deflects it and counterattacks, throwing RJ back into a glass coffee table. And yet, here you are. Maybe I did something right. Mr. Colt mocks as he watches RJ wipe away the blood now dripping from his face. Now, are you going to calm yourself down? Or am I gonna have to beat all this extra energy out of you? Mr. Colt pulls out his patented blood red nunchaku and begins to swing them about. Colt swings his weapon and RJ dodges the attack before landing a kidney shot. This gives RJ the little time he needs to steal Mr. Colt's weapon and strangle him with it. Mr. Colt struggles to get free and when he cannot free himself from the hole, Mr. Colt tells RJ, If you're not careful, I won't tell you where your dad is. 
RJ hesitates before finally releasing Mr. Colt, causing him to fall to his knees and gasp for air. Let me ask you this, where do you think old Richie Boyle is? You don't think he just stood you up, do you? Left town without saying a word or grabbing any of his stuff. I don't know. Come on, don't insult me. I taught you better. Mr. Colt produces a number of photographs from his pocket and throws them on the floor for RJ to see. RJ kneels down and examines the pictures to find Bucky Barnes standing over the dead body of his father in an alley. Mr. Colt tells RJ that deep down, he already knew. It's why he's at his dad's apartment, looking for proof. Well, now he has it. His hero can't be trusted. RJ races back to Bucky's house and begins packing his bags in a scramble to leave as soon as possible. On his way out, Bucky catches him and asks him for a moment to speak. No, I don't think you want that, RJ tells him. Wait, are you leaving? I'm not staying here. RJ continues towards the staircase to the bottom floor and when Bucky tries to stop him, RJ turns around and throws the pictures that Mr. Colt gave him in Bucky's face. Where? How did... Bucky stammers. He fully intended on speaking with RJ, but had never expected for RJ to already know. What? RJ asks. He didn't have a convenient excuse of mind control? so he didn't deserve another chance? RJ, listen to me. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to see you. It was an accident. Bucky stops what he's doing like a deer in headlights as he watches the rage transform RJ's face into a scowl. An accident? You hated him. RJ kicks Bucky down the stairs, and before Bucky can roll to his feet, RJ tackles him to the floor. He then lifts Bucky by his collar before repeatedly hitting him in the face. Again and again, RJ hammers down his fists, fueled by anger. Bucky never believed his dad could change. He just wanted him gone. Again and again, RJ strikes down, causing blood to spill, causing Bucky's eyes to swell shut. Fight me, RJ demands. Fight me! Bucky lays there and takes one hit after another, refusing to fight back. I'm not. I'm not going to do that. You don't need any more reasons. If you want to kill me, then kill me. RJ stops for a second. As he regains his senses, he raises his hands and examines them. Blood drips from them. His eyes begin to mirror the action as tears begin to roll down the sides of his face. I'm... I'm not a killer. I know, Bucky agrees. RJ walks across the room and grabs his bag. Don't follow me. Don't look for me. I don't ever want to see you again. Bucky sadly obliges, telling RJ, If that's what you really want, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. This couldn't have turned out any better for us. Later, the rain begins to pour. The gentle pitter-patter of the raindrops provide a cool ambiance for one Mr. Colt, who is currently riding comfortably in the back seat of a limousine. He pours himself a glass of scotch as he finishes up a phone call. Soon, the boy will return, of his own free will. It's simple, really. I showed him the truth, and he has nowhere else to go. As a street light slowly turns from yellow to red, 
the limousine comes to a halt. Mr. Colt thinks nothing of it. He sits smugly in the back seat, taking sip after sip, cheering for his own machination in motion, unaware of the shadowy figure slowly growing over the window. At the last second, Mr. Colt looks up to find RJ standing in the pouring rain with a gun pointed directly at him. Before he can react, RJ pulls the trigger. Bullets piece holes into the car like it were paper thin. Time slows down. Seconds drag on until the clip is finally empty. The roaring from the weapon subsides and RJ is left with nothing but the company of the rain. He stands there, stuck in his sorrow, the air now heavy with gun smoke. A couple of days later, Bucky stands in front of a tombstone and waits. He stands there for some time until Sharon Carter arrives to accompany him. The two look down at the slab of stone and Sharon tells him, Shield may no longer be a thing, but that doesn't mean there aren't still people who owe me favors. But I really can't pull those strings again, Bucky. I know, Bucky tells her as he places his hand on the headstone. I really, God, I really screwed this one up, didn't I? Do you actually want me to answer that? I just, I know how wrong this could go for him. I've been down that path. Once you're in that place, you just hate yourself so much that you can't imagine how anyone else could ever not hate you. It's the loneliest thing, Sharon. And for a kid, oh God, I just wanted to save him from that. Well. That's the problem, isn't it? Helping someone and saving them are two different things. You can't make someone perfect, Bucky. And you can't be perfect. Sharon is interrupted by the ringing of Bucky's phone. Who is it? She asks. I don't know. It's coming through our scrambled VOIP must be someone new. Are you going to answer? I don't know that I should. Well, you can either learn from this or you can dwell on it. Either way, whoever's calling still needs help. Sharon leaves Bucky and he continues to stare at his phone as it sits there, lit up in his palm. Finally, he answers it and says, This is Bucky Barnes. How can I help you? <laughs>